Thank you guys for coming out and welcome. It's a small little tight group here tonight. It'll be the same quality, same but divided quality. by a smaller number of people means more quality per person. Exactly. <laughs> I love that. So my name is Lee Kachevsky. I actually um, started this meetup a few weeks ago now. My background is in entrepreneurship. I'm actually an optician by training. So I work in optics and eyewear specifically. It's kind of my background. But I started to think a little bit about how clarity and alignment in optics translate to leadership questions actually through a number of different conversations that Josh and I had. We started brainstorming the idea of maybe doing something that would have to do with, with leadership. And so this was kind of the, the genesis of that. In terms of my own background, that is, that's pretty much it. You know, I'm, I'm interested in how leadership affects us day to day and how we can find the actions that real leaders use to better align ourselves day to day. And Josh was, for me, a primary example of that. Just to do a very quick introduction about Josh, Josh has five Ivy League degrees. PhD in astrophysics, MBA, teaches here, the list goes on and on and on and on. Very, very, very impressive background. And I always admired the fact that Josh had this immense capacity for discipline in his life and thought that perhaps maybe we could have a conversation around that particular alignment and, and how he uses it day to day. So welcome and uh, welcome to the first meetup that we've done here. It's, uh, thank you, Josh. Thank you. Yeah. I guess I'll start with, um, I guess I'll go way back to in, in school. I mean, you mentioned astrophysics PhD. I, I was a, a nerd geek growing up, if you couldn't tell. Somewhere in college, I grew up and I was like, you know, I kept trying to hide from doing tech stuff. And I was like, you know what? I love physics. So I, I majored in physics, got my PhD. Real quick, if you want more details, I can give more details. But uh, as much as I, I still love physics, I didn't like the life of a researcher. It wasn't the life I wanted to live. Left, grad, well, finished the PhD and overlapped with starting my first company. And so as a CEO of the company that I co-founded, I guess my first leadership role, and that was maybe where this began. That was the late 90s, early 2000s. Then the recession hit. I lost control of the company. I didn't really know how to run a company. And I got squeezed out by the investors. A little while after that, I decided I wanted to keep starting companies. And so I went to business school. And that's, business school is where I learned that there are classes in leadership. I didn't know that before, nor did I care about that before. I figured, I don't know, I didn't really think about it. The leadership classes were... To me, they opened the door to the side of life that I didn't really think about before because I thought I had my reason, rational side, and the emotions were the opposite. Or the, you know, they were irrational and, and didn't make sense, so I didn't really think about them. That was about 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago. And in the intervening 10 years, leadership has grown from being like a, a background interest to being something like a, an overwhelming interest. Business school, I think of as opening the door with lectures and case study, but not actually doing stuff. And then in the past 10 years, it's been really learning how to practice leadership. And then in the past five years in particular, how to teach leadership, which I teach through active social experiential teaching. Along the way, I started a professor who ran a program at NYU, invited me to teach here. So I teach at NYU. And I teach through spodekacademy.com, which is where I teach independently. And I do coaching and stuff like that. So I want to distinguish, at first, leadership from management. So management, loosely speaking, is... If I have authority over someone, I can say to them, do this, and if you do it well, I'll give you a bonus. If you don't do this, I'm going to fire you, you know, loosely speaking. If you have authority, the person's going to do it. If they have to do it, they have to do it, otherwise they'll get punished. Leadership, on the other hand, is working with someone's emotions and finding out what motivates them and connecting that motivation to the work. And if you do that effectively, they will be, if you do it very effectively, they may be inspired. If you do it just partly, then they'll be, you imbue the, the work with meaning and purpose. Management is important in some, in some contexts. Leadership is important in other contexts, and often people need both. So now, I'm gonna, I put to you guys a question. If leadership is motivating people to achieve a goal in the area of the environment, can we all agree the climate is changing, the temperature of the planet is going up on average, sea levels are rising, and it's due to human behavior, that we're putting carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the environment. And even if we stopped right now, the sea levels are going to keep rising. We can't stop what's already happened. But we're not slowing, we're, I mean, we're still doing more. And so if the sea levels keep rising, if the climate keeps changing, hundreds of millions, maybe billions of people will be displaced from their homes. Weather will change. There'll be pestilence. I mean, it, possibilities include droughts in some places and flooding in others and diseases and things like that. Okay. Not everyone agrees, but the evidence seems overwhelming to me. And we probably have to change our behavior in order to prevent catastrophe from happening. 
In the area of the environment, can anyone name leaders, actual people, names of people who are leaders in the environment, in the area of climate change? I'm putting this out to you guys. Okay, Al Gore. Anyone else? Jesse. Okay, so someone in the Rockefeller Foundation? A Rockefeller University? Okay. So collecting evidence. Is this person leading people, influencing their behavior? Okay. Anybody else? So we're now hitting, well, I've been asking a lot of people this question. And the most common answer I get is no one. Most people can't name anyone. The next most common answer I get is Al Gore. The next most common answer I get is Leonardo DiCaprio. That was more because he came out with this movie before the flood, not long ago. And so that's trailing off. It's, it's, by the way, it's available online for free, so I, I recommend watching the movie. So I'm going to mention a couple names of people who, when we think of leadership as being influencing people to behave in ways that they want to, you know, to get something done. I'm going to give you a couple names, and you're going to go like this. What? Oh, yeah, I guess so. Okay, so some names that are by far the biggest leaders in the area of the environment, of getting people to behave in certain ways. The Koch brothers, Donald Trump. I think by far, in terms of getting, now you guys are probably thinking the other direction, right? I was too. So the, the, the greenhouse effect was discovered something like 100 years ago. And I don't think it was, a, it was a long time before anyone thought humans could actually do something on the scale that would affect the, the planet. And maybe for the past decades, people were like, maybe. And the past several years, it's incontrovertible evidence, in my opinion. Now, in the past couple of weeks, it's like front page headline news of the paper of record. Is, I mean, is anybody missing this? I think if we take all of the people, there's no, I can't quantify this, but if we take all the scientists who are working on reducing the effect of global warming, we take all that and add it up together and compare that to the effect of Donald Trump getting elected in terms of the effect on, say, the amount of carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases in the environment, I think it's very small compared to the effect of him getting elected. I think there are a lot of people working on trying to lead in the environment. They're trying to influence other people. But in my experience, what I observe is that people, there's a lot of spreading facts and there's a lot of, there's a lot of doom and gloom and guilt. There's a lot of trying to pass laws. Now, I'm not opposed to any of these. I think we do education and spreading facts, I think is very important. But I think that it's not that effective in influencing people's behavior. In my experience, I mean, the example that I always give is that in this country right now, we probably have more information about nutrition and diseases of excess of any time in history. And we also have the most diseases of excess of any time in history. And it's not from lack of people having the information. I think when you have, when you know what you want to do, but the alternative is comfort and convenience. It's very easy to do the comfort and convenience. I think a lot of people do this calculation. People my age and older, I'm 45, so people my age and older, they do this calculation, they hear, by 2050, the sea levels are going to, something, something big is going to happen, and it's going to be around 2050. And they do this. They say, let's say I was born in 1971, so I'll be roughly about 80 years old. That was close. That's going to be a big problem, but not for me. And last I checked, you know, everyone in government and the heads of companies, all the decision makers with authority right now are my age and older. So younger people aren't making that cal calculation, but they can't do a whole lot about it just yet. Another calculation that a lot of people do is it's a hot summer day, it's July, it's like 100 degrees out, and you're uncomfortable, and you think, I want to turn on the air conditioner. Or maybe your friend just came back from Guatemala, and you're like, oh, I want to go to Guatemala, and you think, I want to do that. And then you think maybe that might pollute a bit, flying in an airplane, turning on an air conditioner. If I go, I get to see Guatemala, or I get to have a comfortable room. If I don't, I don't pollute, but... If I don't go to Guatemala, and everyone else travels as they were going to anyway, if I don't turn on the air conditioner, everyone else does, it doesn't really matter what I do, and might as well be comfortable then. I don't want to be the chump that sacrifices when everybody else benefits, so I might as well turn on the air conditioner and go to Guatemala. So I believe that we have an overwhelming number of people who want to not pollute, who want to leave the world a better place than they found it, but through calculations like that end up feeling like I might as well keep doing what I was doing. And so I think we have a lot of people who want to do one thing, but aren't doing it. And to me, that is, that is the role of leadership, is to help people realize what they want to do and help them do that. Because if they want to do it, but they're not doing it. You know, I had a friend who, a few years ago, we're hanging out in Midtown, and he says, Josh, I gotta run, and he goes downtown. And I remember him mentioning where he was going. And it wasn't until later, I'm watching TV, 
And he, he was going to Zuccotti Park. Later on, I was like, were you involved with that Occupy stuff? This is when it was still not yet global stuff. And he goes, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm involved with Occupy Wall Street. I'm helping getting it going. And I go, wow, that sounds like a really amazing leadership opportunity. That sounds like you could really do something there. And he goes, no, 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 no. That is not a leadership thing. This is a grassroots, no central anything. This is something that's going to happen on its own. I thought, okay, I'm not really involved with it. I went down there a couple times. Different people will take away different things from it. One of my takeaways is that without leadership, and I'm not saying a strong central authority, but without people organizing and taking responsibility and, and uh, accountability, my takeaway, others might see it differently, was that it's hard for something to really take root and, and keep going and grow because I think it had a lot of potential. And so one of my takeaways is that if we don't have leadership in the area of the environment, and by the way, leadership of reducing global warming, because we got leadership in the other direction already, I don't see it taking off. A few years ago, I was, you know, I, I have my book, I have my, my, my teaching, my courses. I'm trying to get out there more. I do public speaking. I thought one of the things I would do to be able to get my voice heard more is, I know that people talk about the environment. It's like a, a topic that's current. And I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll mention that I think people should have a certain set of criteria for their voice to be something really worth listening to. So I said, I'll mention that people should have a background in science, experience and skills in leadership, experience and skills in entrepreneurship, you know, taking initiative and making things happen, and probably some academic credentials. So that describes my background. So, you know, I was saying this to get me out there, to get people to want me on TV or whatever. So at first I thought this will be my foot in the door, this will be my nose under the tent to get into things. But over the years, as I've met more and more people who work on leading or who want to influence people, when I talk to scientists, it seems to me they're really big on education. They're really big on getting people to, they want to get laws changed. But information alone doesn't seem to work. Changing laws without popular support is to me authoritarian. And I find that people resist authority, even if they agree with the law. And the doom gloom, you guys have your relationships, in my experience, making people feel guilty, it hasn't worked for me in motivating people, not in the way that I want them to be motivated. So now I'm starting to think that maybe those criteria that I thought would be nice to have are actually maybe essential. That I don't know many people who see the picture, who, you know, Al Gore, coming from politics, he's naturally, through no fault of his own, he's going to have a lot of people who just oppose him. But he also, you know, it wasn't long before people were finding out how much emissions his house and his flying and all that stuff were, were causing. And Leonardo DiCaprio, he just doesn't have the science background. He's got a voice that a lot of people listen to. But I don't think he's got the credibility to, for people to really follow him. So I, I start thinking, maybe what's needed is someone with those criteria. Maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less in some areas, but I don't see people with those criteria. I don't see people who are really making things happen. And this, this weird thing happened to me not long ago that I felt like if someone with those criteria doesn't step up, maybe there isn't. Maybe we need someone with some of those, those criteria. And I started feeling like maybe it has to be me. Not me, just me, but people like me. And I started feeling a sense of responsibility. And so what brings us here now is that we're well, talking to Lee and talking to a lot of people about the stuff that I've been talking about. Partly, I look at the challenge of leading people. I can't prove this, but I think there's billions of people who want to reduce their pollution, their global warming effect. And I think the challenge of leadership is to get them to take that and get past, you know, instead of concluding, I might as well go to Guatemala and I might as well just turn on the air conditioner instead of not leading. I mean, all these people are saying, someone else should do it first. We should pass a law and then I'll follow the law, but I'm not going to actually do it myself first, which is the opposite of leadership. Leadership would be leading to doing it first. I don't know how to get billions of people to change their behavior. I don't know if it's ever been done before to consciously try to do that. Gandhi influenced hundreds of millions. Martin Luther King influenced tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions. But if we get a hundred million people, if we get a billion people to change your behavior, but not the other seven billion, six billion, seven billion, it's not enough. So it's never been done before. It's this weird feeling that it's like now I'm conscious of like being recorded. I don't know how this will sound, but to think like, who do I, like if I, to be the Martin Luther King, the Mandela of the environment, it's like, if I heard someone say that, like, I think that's what's necessary. Not just one person, because there's different problems and, you know, what we, what we need to do in the United States is different than what has to happen in Africa or Asia or Australia or South America, because there are different issues in different places. But to me, if I heard someone say, 
you want to influence a billion people and you want to do it within a couple of decades because the sea levels are rising and that's, that sets the time scale. I'd be like, that's a lot of gumption. Like, I don't know who you think you are. And it makes me feel very vulnerable to put that out there. But partly I'm thinking, that's what we need. Because if we don't have that, I don't think it's got, everything that has been done so far, all the education, all the doom and gloom, all the predictions, all the attempts at passing laws and so forth, it's not working. I don't know if people see it any differently than me, but it doesn't seem to be working. In the past, we have had cases where people have done stuff that they felt was right, even though it was very difficult. So the civil rights in the 60s is a big example. World War II was a big example. A lot of people sacrificed. A lot of people said, all right, we will ration oil. We will plant gardens in our front yard so that we can have more resources. But I don't see it happening now. I'm not sure exactly how to make it happen. King, Mandela, Gandhi, they had a strategy of nonviolent civil disobedience, which was effective. They didn't make it up. It was there before. And it's effective at if there's a majority of people that believe that a law should change, but they're not doing anything. Nonviolent civil disobedience will get people, will make people realize this law, we're putting people in jail for sitting at lunch counters together. That's not, we don't think that's right. So if you don't make that, if you don't make people conscious of it, they're like, whatever, we don't care. We're doing other stuff. So that was a way of making people feel conscious of it. I don't see how nonviolent civil disobedience would work with the environment. We can't change physical law. Those are, as far as I know, the laws of nature are, are stuck the way they are. I like them the way they are. I don't really know how to influence people in this area. I don't know what the strategy would be. Earlier versions of this talk, I had presentations and slides and I went through in this logical order and I was trying to get people to, I was trying to lead to a call to action that people could follow that might make something happen. But every time that I did it, I kept hitting, it's like when people want to do something and they're not doing it, I don't know about anybody else, but in my, in, for me, it means that I have to rationalize why I'm not doing what I think is right. If I go to someone and say, you're wrong about something, they might disagree and say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not wrong. And we have like a kind of conversation. But if I point out that what they believe and what they're doing are inconsistent, they tend to get mad at me. And I don't like that. And it's, but more than not liking it, it's ineffective. And then I lose the ability to influence the people. And so this talk that I prepared that was well put together, it was like walking into a minefield. And I kept just getting people resisting because I get this a lot. Yes, this is a problem. We got to do something about it. We all have to change. And then I'll move along and be like, yes, we, not just, not just passing laws for organizations to change and governments to change, but the people have to change. And I say, you know, that means we, you and I have to change. And they're like, no, no, not me. I'm not going to change. Like I, you got to understand, I got to fly to Portland next week for business and I'm not going to change that for anyone. And I like steak. If you want me not to eat meat, sorry, sorry to the planet, but that's the way it is. It was not effective at all. What Lee and I have gone back and forth is like how to make this talk work because I, I'm not really sure exactly. I'm just trying to get farther each time that I do this in the minefield without stepping on a, a landmine that I completely lose the person. Can I make a quick comment? Yeah. Josh and I had, were having a conversation about diet. It's one of these things that we think a lot about in terms of our own bodies and taking that and creating a healthy lifestyle, etc. And when I saw this firsthand from walking into Josh's apartment, his trash, a bag of trash, gets emptied out maybe once every six months. He throws away one bag. And I thought to myself, like, I must be doing something really wrong here, right? <laughs> like, my day-to-day, -day, I've got a cat there, I'm hairballs all over the place, you know, trying to clean everything up. I, I'm just, it really inspired me to start thinking a little bit differently about how I behave in my day-to-day. And that was part of the engagement of this conversation was around food. And I think food also has a very big impact on the environment. Can you talk a little bit about how food has influenced your ideas of emissions and, and all these things about packaging? Because I think that's a really important component to all of this. It's like we can influence on individual levels through our, our intake, through our diets, can you talk a little bit more yeah. about that kind of expand about? Because I think what we need here are kind of <coughs> action items in a way to help us get to a point where we're we're making an impact on a day to day level, and I think that's important is kind of tying food into that conversation. Okay, so I'm going to talk about food, and I'm going to put, give it a little context also, because yeah. food was one of these experiments that I've done. I think a lot of people, when you suggest to them changing their behavior 
in order to pollute less, in order to contribute less to global warming. I think a lot of people's association is deprivation and sacrifice. So I want you to think about that because I noticed a lot of my garbage was, came from food. And I wanted to pollute less. You know, we're going to have more plastic in the ocean than fish within a decade or two, or I don't know, sometime soon. More plastic in the ocean than fish. I had this idea that I wanted to have less waste. So I thought maybe I'm going to, what I ended up doing was I gave myself, I said, for one week, I'm going to have no food where I have to throw away packaging afterward. When I first had the idea, I thought, how am I going to plan this out? Can I make it? If you guys think to right now, could you go for a week without getting any food with, with packaging? Okay. I didn't think, I wasn't sure if I could. So I, I, I applaud you guys. <laughs> and the other thing was that a lot of times when you talk about diet, people tend to like debate you and, and, and point out how, oh, you're not consistent and stuff like that. So I thought, I, got, I better get this really tight. Months and months went by, and finally one day I said, you know, this isn't going anywhere. I'm, I'm trying to plan it. I'm trying to argue with people that I haven't argued. It starts now. And so just right then I said, all right, no more, for one week, no food with packaging. And I made it two and a half weeks. I knew I wasn't going to die, but I didn't really know how I was going to do it. And it turns out I had to have a lot more fruits and vegetables. And there's a bulk food store near me where I can bring a bag and load it up with legumes. So I had, uh, and mushrooms and stuff like that. So I could get all fresh, raw ingredients. After two and a half weeks, I bought my first thing. It was a bag of onions. And I was like, wait, I didn't need to get this bag. And that was a little over a year ago. And in that year, I've gotten one can of food since then. And as Lee said, okay, so I compost, you know, the scraps. And then I put the recycling and the recycling. And then the landfill garbage goes in this canvas bag. So the canvas bag is like, you know, the size of a, can a tote bag size. When that fills up, I take it down the hall, open up the trash chute, pour it down. And then I have an empty bag. And then I restart again. So the last time that I emptied my canvas bag was December 4th. It's pretty full right now. I was going to do it, I was going to empty it May 4th, but I might go to June, anyway. Now, not throwing stuff away is kind of interesting. The bigger thing is that I've had to learn how to cook better than I could cook before. I want to mention another experiment that I did, which was to have no food where fiber's been removed. Anyway, that's another little, I do these little experiments. The net result is that I basically have to buy fresh fruits, vegetables, the legumes, the beans, and the lentils, and the dal, and stuff like that, that stuff is dried, but I cook it at home. I almost don't go to supermarkets at all. Like, I walk into Whole Foods. It's like a wasteland to me. Trader Joe's, there's like nothing, almost nothing there. Farmer's Market is like a cornucopia. Oh, and let me give you one other experiment that I did. When I was in Europe a little over a year ago, I guess I found out how much pollution flying causes. If you fly from New York to L.A. and back, coach, it's roughly equivalent to one year of driving. Most people are a little surprised at that. It's more than they expect. Or if you put it in terms of the, um, the Paris Accords to try to keep, keep the sea level temperature rise within one and a half or two degrees Celsius, what each individual is allocated for about one year, you get close to that in one trip across the country and back. So if you want people to pollute less and you think that some industry is polluting a lot and we should reduce that, but you're flying a couple times across the country and back, or you go to Europe or Asia or, or Australia, you're way over the limit yourself. When I learned these numbers, I just gave myself this other challenge, which was I just decided I'm going to go for one year without flying. So that was in March of 2016. So I'm in month 14 now. And by the way, my book came out in the middle of that. So like a book tour is a kind of useful thing. Like it's not like I don't fly. I fly a lot. But this now I'm into, you know, 14 months of without it. You might say avoiding food packaging, avoiding fiber removed food, avoiding flying. It, does that sound negative to you guys? It might. But the experience to me of what happened is not that I'm, if I'm not flying, I'm not sitting at home staring at the wall. I'm finding out other things to do. If I can't get packaged food, then I'm not getting food delivered from other places. I don't know about you, but to me, tropical fruit, like that's my favorite stuff. Mango, durian, pineapple, that's what I want to eat. And that's my favorite stuff. I can't do that right now. Not that I can't, I choose not to. So what do you do if you're not doing those things? Well, in my case, now it's kind of we're into the spring, but not long ago, we had winter in New York City. So what does that mean if you're buying only local stuff? I wasn't saying local, I'm just not getting stuff that's shipped in from other places, so it ends up being local. So it's like rutabagas and kohlrabi and turnips, parsnips, cabbage, uh, with your lot of cabbage, pumpkins, and uh, radishes, turnips, things like that. Now, I don't know about you, but if someone says, would you like a radish? Or would you like a mango? I'm going to pick the mango. But if that's all I'm eating, I'm not going to sit there and be like, I'm eating terrible stuff and I don't like it. I'm just going to stay that way and be miserable. I figure out how to cook it together. 
How would you describe the meals? How many meals have you had of mine? A few? How would you describe them? I'd say it's kind of the food version of the mashup to music. And you just throw everything in a pressure cooker and you get these amazing flavors. They work. It's very flavorful. I was surprised, actually. The first time Josh invited me over for something to eat, he's like, come and have my magic do. And I was like, <laughs> oh, what is this going to be? And I, I may have said, I called it a soup, and there was a little bit of an offensiveness there. Defensiveness. It's a stew. And he said, it's a stew. And I said, all right, let's, let's enjoy the stew. So I went over. I was incredibly surprised. And the thing for me that's really powerful here and interesting is that restraint in itself can actually create more value for you in the end. And this is something that I've been thinking of on a, cre on a creative level in my own work, but can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think when most people, again, you bring up this point of depriving yourself of something. Generally, people think about doing without something as being a bad thing, but you've enriched your life by producing limitations to your actions or to what you can and cannot eat. Can you talk a little bit? Yeah, like I said, I'm not gonna sit there and be like, bemoaning that I'm not going to Costa Rica, the net effect of not having these things in my life has been to find what is rewarding. As it turns out, there was no packaging for food for most of human existence. There were no airplanes for most of human existence. And people were happy. I dare say possibly happier than we are today on average. I don't know. I didn't do the calculations. I didn't do the measurements. If you force yourself, you can figure this stuff out. Look, I went through a long period of steamed vegetables. I'm not going to turn away steamed vegetables, but I'm not really a fan of steamed vegetables. When I go out and people like, have a salad, I'm like, that's not really food to me. It's not satisfying. It's not enough. I had to go through a period of what felt like deprivation. When I came out the other end, it's discovery and joy. And for me, remember I said people, I think a lot of people associate changing their behavior to pollute less with deprivation and sacrifice. But for me, when I think of changing my, my behavior to be more in line with polluting less, I think of number one, Delicious. Number two, convenient. Number three, saving money. Number four, community. I don't know anyone who doesn't like delicious. I don't know anyone who doesn't like saving money, who doesn't like convenience, who doesn't like community. There's more of that in my life. My life, look, I can't say what anybody else's values are. Your values are your values. But my values, by my values, my life is simply better. By every measurable way I can come up with, it's better for my having done what looked like deprivation before. And what I hope to somehow work out in the area of leadership in the environment is to get people, is to change the mindset or associate the associations that they have from climate change to deprivation and sacrifice to get that to delicious, convenient, save money, community, or whatever it is for you. I don't know exactly how to do that. I think it has to come through experience. I mean, one of the calls to action that I hope to come out of this is for people here to commit Maybe, if you're up for it, maybe go for a week without food packaging. I didn't even think of it, but now that I've asked all of you guys, I didn't hear anyone saying no. All of you who said yes can, in principle, do it. I'm not going to try to get you to do it, but I'm going to give you as an option. Or maybe if you, you know, like, what are the things that cause a lot of global warming? Is driving and flying and eating meat. You guys know. There's no shortage of information of what's causing global warming. If you guys didn't know about how much pollution air flying caused, it wasn't because the information is not on the internet. I don't think the problem is a lack of information. And I don't want to get caught in the trap of, here's some tips for you. Here's some information you didn't already know. Because if, if the information's out there, and I say you collectively, not you individuals, but if people aren't getting the information, if they're not processing the information, it's not because there's a lack of information. So if I get caught in the trap of, here's some information, or here's some tips, I haven't led you. I haven't done my job. I haven't influenced you to get to the point where you want to find that information out on your own. And where you feel like, I've made this change. My life is more delicious than it was before. My life has more saving money, more convenience, and more community than it has before. That helped. I want to do the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. That's what I'm trying to get going. Has anyone here heard of the Eden Project? I think there's one going up in the Southwest. It originally began in the north of England. So there's this guy, Tim Smith, Sir Tim Smith, as far as I know, the first knight that I've spoken to. He was walking around in the north of England, came across an empty coal mine. It's just a big crater with no life in it that, you know, they got all the coal and it's just a lifeless pit now, or it was at the time. And he had the idea somehow to turn it into the Eden Project, which is this big garden, it is now a garden that is apparently the most diverse garden in Europe. And there's like these geodesic domes and it's this big tourist destination. 
and he's going to start a couple in the United States and some in China and some all around the world. It's growing. It's it's kind of a cool thing. And I recommend you guys look it up. And if you're in England, I recommend checking it out. Now I'm talking to him, and he says how he came to the United States, and he was talking to some farmers, Midwest, South, I forget exactly where. And he's talking to them about farmer-related stuff, gardening type stuff. And he's like, I forget the details, but the aquifers were draining them. That's a problem. They're like, yes, that's a problem. We've got to figure out how to not drain these aquifers. And he says, you know, these monocultures, that's a problem. And they're like, yeah, we need diversity because if, if we have these monocultures, then, you know, one virus could wipe out everything. And he says, factory farming, and they're like, that's a big issue. Family farms are getting all knocked out by that. And all this agreement. And he goes, and then there's climate change. And they're like, fuck you. He's like, what happened? We were just agreeing on everything. He wasn't trying to influence them or persuade them. He just listened to them. So for these farmers, climate change to them meant the government comes in and tells you what you can and can't do. And the big agribusiness, ConAgra and Monsanto and whatever, they can do whatever they want. To them, climate change means, and by the way, not just government, but Democrats. So climate change to them means the Democrats coming in and telling you what you can't do, handing everything over to the big agribusiness, and they're getting squeezed out of their livelihood. And that's the association for them. And so if you talk climate change to them, they're like, get away from me. That, I believe, is the result of attempts at leading through authority without getting popular support first. I applaud and support people who are working on influencing institutions, government and large organizations and so forth. People are doing that. But I think they're really hampered by not working on changing individuals, of getting popular support, of getting people to say, yes, it does look like sacrifice now. Yes, it does look like deprivation now. But I believe that if I act, and not just for me to change my diet, I have to say, no more planning. I just, right now, I'm going to start. I'm going to change my behavior and see what happens. And I learned. And for people to say, I'm going to try it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to experiment. I'm going to try out. Maybe it's what I'm suggesting. You know, I'm going to find stuff out and change my behavior. On the other end, I will look back and I'll be glad that I did that. There's precedent before. I think if you look at civil rights, Martin Luther King didn't get people to do what he wanted them to do. He got them to do what they wanted to do. He showed them how. If you look at what they're doing, they're getting sprayed by fire hoses, they're getting attacked by dogs, they're getting hit by police, they're getting put in jail. That's what you see. If you look in their hearts and minds, I believe that what they're doing is they're creating freedom and justice and equality, using a strategy and a technique that creates that. But I think if you, I don't know if it was so obvious at the time that that would happen, but I think if you talk to people today that were there, I think they would be glad that they did it. I think a lot of people today say, I don't want to do this thing. It's, it's like deprivation. I don't, I think the challenge of a leader is to make that association of, I want to do these things that look like, yes, it may look like deprivation today, but I'm going to come out and be glad that I did. Another parallel is coincidentally, somehow in the past few months, two friends of mine got diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. I'm not a medical doctor, so I don't really know. I only know what they've told me. But one of them was like, he was livid. He said, I went to the doctor. The doctor said, I'm pre-diabetic. So I pre-diabetic. And the doctor said, you're going to have to take this medicine for the rest of your life. And he went online and started researching this stuff. Again, this is what he told me. So I don't really know all the details of the medicine side of things. But there's some diseases where a virus gets inside you, a bacteria gets inside you, and your body's fighting that thing off. Apparently, type 2 diabetes is like you're filling yourself with stuff that's not healthy, and your body's reacting in the way that would happen if you take un put unhealthy, unhealthy stuff in it. And so this guy says that the doctor says you got to take this medicine, but if you take this medicine, you must also eat this food that requires you to take the medicine. But then he also kept doing the research, and he also found out that if you change your diet, you can reverse this. So he changed his diet. And by the way, he was eating multiple pints of ice cream per week before the diabetes. So he had a burning platform that said you're going to die or you have to take this medicine. Now he will not go back. Like, if you could magically let him eat all the ice cream he wanted and he wouldn't get diabetes, he would not do it because he's changed his diet now and he likes what he eats much more. His self-awareness goes up. His appreciation goes up. And by the way, he also will outright say he believes that the heads of the pharma companies should be in jail because he's like, to which I would add the heads of the, well, at first I would add the CEOs of McDonald's and, and, and Pepperidge Farm and all those other, and Kraft and Keebler and all those places. Although I point out no one forced anyone to eat those things. People chose to eat those things. But he would not go back. We have that opportunity to not go back. Do we need the burning platform? Everyone knows the, the, the story of the burning platform? It comes from this, I forget when, but in the North Sea, there's like the oil rigs. And one of them was on fire. 
So it takes a certain amount of time for the boats to get out there. So when the boats get there, some people are in the water, and the North Sea is like really choppy. To get from where the people are on the platform into the water, it's like a big jump into choppy water, freezing cold water. You're not going to live that long in this water. And so people get there in the boats, and they're helping people into the boats. And they're like, how did you jump in the water? You could have easily died. You weren't going to last much longer. And the water's crazy. And they say, the platform was on fire. So this is a common thing in leadership. If you want to motivate people, you create a burning platform. The diabetes diagnosis was a burning platform for these guys that they had to change. But both of them say, I had the disease. Diabetes is one thing, but I had the disease of a life that was not as good as it could have been well before the diagnosis. And I wish I had changed earlier. I want to get to a place where people are saying, I wish I had changed earlier. The thing is, when I talk to people about the idea of maybe postponing a flight, they really push back. And I'm not sure exactly how to get to where people say, I want to do that. The only way I know how to solve a hard problem, and this to me is a hard problem, is how do you get people to change their behavior when it's much more comfortable and convenient not to? You feel like a chump if you're the one who's doing it and no one else is. What's the point? The only way I know how to solve a really hard problem is to solve an easier problem that's related, develop skills and experience from that, and solve a slightly harder problem, and a harder problem, and a harder problem, until you reach the problem that you really want to solve. And we are here right now as an early stage of trying to solve something. I don't really know if it's possible. I don't know if it's possible to change the behavior of enough people in the time set by the sea levels rising. I don't know. Do you guys think it's possible? I think, I, I'm sorry, I think it's possible. I think it's possible. Will it happen? I'm not sure. Really, the way I look at it, it's probably, the odds aren't in our favor. But even then, it's not a matter of black and white. Black and white is, is how you look at things when, when you're not skilled in that area. When you get more skilled, you get nuance. It looks to me like, you know, there's some carrying capacity of the planet. If we go over it and we keep producing waste that we do, you have what they call in systems thinking of overshoot and collapse. If you overshoot, you can go for a little while living on fossil fuels and fish that are not being renewed and so forth, but eventually it collapses. You get below that population. Now, if we can plan it, maybe we can get up, find out where the carrying capacity is and stay below that, and then things are more comfortable. But even if we have overshoot and collapse, even if we can't stop ourselves, we need, even if it has to be nature that does it to us, there's degrees of disaster. You know, you can plummet to like no civilization left at all. Or maybe you end up with like a few billion people. That's still billions of people. It's still worth it because there's a lot of people who are saying, we've passed the point of no return. There's nothing we can do. We might as well just go for like full on enjoy life to the maximum we possibly can. But I don't see it that way. I think we can't, every, doing something still makes a difference. Even if we can't do everything, we can still do something. How many people here have read Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl? A few? A couple? Okay. So does it, do people, I highly recommend this book routinely reviewed as one of the top books of the 20th century, often as one of the top books of all time. Sorry, I just set the bar really high. <laughs> I nonetheless recommend reading it. So it's, this guy, Viktor Frankl, was uh, a contemporary of Freud. I think he learned psychology from Freud. World War II breaks out. The Nazis capture him, put him through a series of concentration camps, eventually Auschwitz. Obviously, one of the worst environments humans have created for other humans. Read the book yourself to get the more details, but What's happening is that there, he's living in an environment where you have a certain number of calories you need to live and he's not getting, they're not getting enough calories to live on. You get a lump of moldy bread and some soup that's like really water and that's all you have to live on. When you're not getting enough to live on, what keeps you going is something beyond just the physical stuff around you. You have to have something to live for. And he writes about that's meaning. Man's search for meaning is having something to live for that's beyond just the physical stuff. And so there were people who you know, you get the, the lump of bread and you have to eat it, you pace yourself over the course of the day so you're getting the maximum nutrition out of it. And you've got to not lose any of it. But even then, when people weren't getting enough to live on, some people would still give a little bit of their bread to someone else who had less or who needed it more. That's meaning. That keeps people going. But there was another thing that he saw too, which was that sometimes you could see people gave up their will to live. They lost that sense of meaning. He said you could tell when people gave it up because they would get the bread and they would just eat it right away. And when they got the cigarettes, it's because they got cigarettes, I guess people thought cigarettes were healthy back then, they would get the cigarettes, and instead of holding onto them and saving them to trade for food from a guard or something like that, they would smoke the cigarettes right away. And he said once someone had given up the will to live and they just ate the bread right away and they just smoked the cigarettes right away, he said it very rarely returned. 
And to me, I am not ready yet to eat my bread, to say, nothing I can do about it, so I might as well just enjoy life. Partly because I have that sense of meaning, but even more to the point, and I hope I get this across, yes, I could go flying. Look, I can afford flying. I like going, I like to see the Eiffel Tower. I like to taste tropical fruits, despite my newfound love for turnips and rutabagas and radishes and things like that, which I never heard of, like, I never heard of kohlrabi before. And now I can't keep it in the house because I eat it so quickly. And cabbage, oh my God. I used to have, I always had a bag of chips and pretzels in my kitchen. In graduate school, I remember I always had ice cream. And every time I bought it, I was like, I don't want to get this. But the thing was that when I was eating it, it felt really good. And then afterward, I feel bad, but I kept buying it. And I felt helpless. I got to say, that's another thing. Delicious, convenient, and, and, and community. Also, I don't feel guilty about eating a lot of radishes and turnips and, and like it's spinach. Oh man, the spring vegetables are out right now. And I'm starting to eat like the spring vegetables. Oh, as much as I like the turnips and radishes, it's so nice because the seasons change, you get new stuff. This is what I'm talking about. I love this. It's more wholesome to me. It's something I like more than I did before. But I hope that people see that it's not just that, that there's meaning, but also at the very selfish level, it's better. Again, I don't know what your values are, so I can't speak for you guys. But for me, it's not just that I'm, that I have this meaning. That alone would be enough for me to keep trying, to say, let's try to reduce our pollution, reduce our carbon footprint and so forth. But also, it's just more delicious. Even if it weren't meaningful, it's just, it's, you're going to like your food more. You're going to like, you're going to get to know your community better because if you can't go and travel the world, you got to make do with the people around you. And it turns out, I got really interesting people in my life and there's nothing special about me. There's a lot of interesting people in the world. If you want people from a different culture, talk to a 100-year-old woman, because she grew up in a totally different environment. She grew up during the Depression, in the wake of World War I. That's very different. Well, stuck in New York as I am, that's some, well, I would have talked to her even though I weren't stuck in New York, but that's one of the things that came out of it. That's what I'm hoping will come out of here, is that people say, I want to change. I want to do these little experiments. I'm not really sure what to, I'm not ending with a call to action here that's like a clear thing of like, you should go for a week without packaging or you should go, go for 365 days without flying. But I'm hoping that I get people to change their mindset, to associate being more, I mean, to me, it's being more in tune with your environment, with joy and pleasure and meeting people around you and discovering yourself. And the way that I look at like the spinach is coming out when I didn't even know, I used to get baby spinach. Do you guys know how like spinach now? It's like these giant leaves when I get in the store, it's all these little baby leaves. It's like, I'm not gonna complain, but I like these really big ones. It's like what brontosaurus used to eat. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the calls to action I'm kind of alluding to. I hope that you guys, do people here feel motivated to give one of those things a shot? Yeah? Yeah, see, I, I'm getting farther along than the practice runs. Because in the practice runs, people are like, I like steak, Josh. Another thing is that, I'm, I'm, can you guys tell that this is, this is a, a, a somewhat rehearsed but not totally practiced presentation? And I want to keep developing it. So this is like, hopefully the first of many. I mean, you will do talks like this, not just me, but other people. Lots of other interesting stuff to, to be said. I will do other ones, probably we'll do some together, but also others. But I also want to find a way of like making a movement, getting this more out there, because I, I don't see a lot of leadership and I think leadership is necessary. I think we should open this up to be a bit more conversational. Like what do you guys, what do you guys think about leadership in the environment yourself? So, like, I'd love to just, yeah, open it up here. I missed the beginning, but you would talk about leadership and the impacts of leadership, I'm assuming. You got Steve Jobs. Did something that has changed culture for, more, for the amount of people you're looking for. Mm -hmm. he, can't, he changed not only the people's perception, which is the first thing you have to change people's perception of what they're doing, and then gave them an example of how to do what they were doing before in a new way. And I think that might be the largest challenge, which is we do need to reduce our waste. We do need to change our habits, but giving people an alternative, which is equal in meaning, is where a miss usually is. I have a diabetic father, and he could not do the simple thing to take a walk for 20 minutes a day. It's a simple, it's a simple action. Couldn't do it because he didn't want to, or didn't feel like it, or he was he not able to? He did it. His rationale was because he had been in the military for 13 years and had to march every day and never wanted to go back to being told what to do to make his life better. 
Mm -hmm. As you said, people will argue against their core belief. Yeah. Right. And I, I think changing people's core belief is an experiential, like in your book, an experiential thing of small steps to eventually re realize instead of rationalize. Yeah, and I, it's, I don't see people, I'm not aware of people doing that, trying to do that. It's such a minefield of they getting pushback. I think they do and they fail. And failure teaches you to do this in our normal standard of education. Failure teaches you to do this. To retreat, to protect. Retreat instead of, okay, I failed, but move out. And that's what separates entrepreneurs from non-entrepreneurial spirit. Anyone else? Yeah, that's a great, great point. Tying kind of to what you're saying, I think, and I'm not one to say just forget about the people right now, but I always find that the biggest impact in terms of changing lifestyle has always been with what you teach children. Mm -hmm. So. I wonder if you have any interest in pursuing educating children in the sense that I remember doing potted plants in elementary school from a little milk carton and create a little plant of some sort. Have you explored ways to incorporate children and in learning some of these concepts? Yes, you know, time is ticking, but if children can learn some of these things and they're taking these concepts back home to their parents or they learn easy recipes or easy things to make when they go to the supermarket with their parents, it, I, I feel like you can impact a lot when you have the children involved. Because those children are eventually going to grow up with that type of, maybe not that mindset, but that, that bug in their ear of, okay, well, I really don't want to waste this much, or I really don't have to have this packaged meal. I, I don't know if you've ever considered working with younger children. So me personally, my natural thing is university and graduate and adults. but. The way I've thought about it, and to answer your question, is that there's not a need for one leader here. It's got to be lots of leaders, because the solution in New York City is different than the solution in the Midwest, which is different than the solution in the South, which is different than the solution in Central America and South America and Africa and so forth. And people are going to have to do this in lots of different areas and lots of different places, and people with different specialties are going to have to do things differently. So I hope to involve lots of, to the extent I'm leading something, I hope to bring in people who are more natural working with children, and they'll do it with children. And what I hope for something to happen, there's so many needs in so many different areas. I think of like what I what, what would come next for me is like it would be great to have someone with legal background to form a, the legal organization. People with design and uh, event planning experience and internet experience to social media stuff to like get the word out and get so that the next one isn't just two, four, six, seven to get double-digit double digit numbers, numbers of people and maybe triple digit numbers of people and then maybe four digits and things like that. I'm not sure. Like at the beginning, when I started telling people, here's what I think we should do, people push back. So now I'm saying this is what I see needs to be done, but I don't really know for sure. And I want to, what I want is to get people to feel motivated. Are you, do you work well with kids? I, I do work well with kids. I don't work with children now, but I do work well with kids. Is it something that you, is this an area that's interesting to you? And Yeah, I, I think there's, Especially on the, the impact of health, because if you tell somebody to stop smoking and you can show them what a black lung looks like, mm -hmm. and they will not put that cigarette down. I think, though it's an addiction, I think we have those same, that same outlook on a lot of different things in our life. You tell somebody to go work out or walk around the block, and they don't want to. So showing people and giving examples, like you mentioned, on how you as an individual can do something that's going to impact you yourself. Mm -hmm. I think the compound effect of that is great. So yeah, you may only get nine people today, but I may decide, okay, instead of tomorrow going to Whole Foods and buying X amount of merchandise that's off the package, I may not do that. And I may have a conversation with my mom about that. She may have a conversation two months from now about, about it with somebody else, but the residual effect, the impact may not be as instant as maybe you may want, but impact alone is mm -hmm. progress. I hope so. Yeah, if you like working with kids, I, I feel like you're taking an easy job. Like, get them before they've, like, got, got like set in their ways. Like, yeah. yeah, when they've been set in their ways, because you have to undo what they learn, uh, undo what they've learned and live, and then try to reteach them. And most, most people don't want to be taught. If somebody doesn't want to be taught, there's nothing you can say or show them or do to... You can't motivate somebody to do something they don't want to do, period. They have to want it themselves. And like you said, the information's out there, so... 
how do you find the people that want to learn or don't know what they want yet? And I think that's the challenge, one of the challenges you're facing. So you say they have to want it. I've never met anyone, and maybe this is just my limited experience, but I've never met anyone who said, I want to leave the world a worse place than I found it. I think everybody wants to leave the world at least neutral, but probably better than they found it. I could be wrong, you know, I'm making an assumption about humans, but to me that's something that every human has, at least a lot. It's got to be at least billions, at least one billion people like that. It's not that I'm trying to get them to change beliefs, but to get at a belief that they already have, that they've been squashing, and get them to bring, get them to feel comfortable sharing that, and stop feeling bad about it, and pushing it down, and suppressing it. Denial and suppression doesn't well, I haven't found that so successful in, in my life. And to get that out there, and attach that to the behavior, and make them feel good about it, make them feel, this is something I really want to do. To me, that's the task. The or the purpose? Because I think there's a difference. If you connect the motivation to the behavior, it feels like purpose. That's the way I see it. Is that what you're saying? For an example, you can connect uh, my desire not to harm the world and make the world worse by not impacting the amount of pollution that I use on the way to work, So, or use in general. So maybe me not flying is not really something that I want to do. Uh, maybe I don't want to not fly, but maybe I can reconsider a particular trip and make it a road trip. You know, it, like it, it may not be that particular action, but something to get me working towards the bigger picture. Does that make sense? That's exactly what I'm looking for. That's what I think is has to happen. If this is gonna if 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 this is gonna change, if people say, "Yes, I could fly. That's I like that." If I don't fly, there's something there for me, more than what I would get if I did fly. Because of, we're a social species. We have empathy and we care about others. And we, I think, care about how we affect other people. And we want to not hurt them, at least, help them if we can. And that's the connection to make. I don't know how well I can do it. I don't know, I'm trying. Maybe someday, after an hour of talking, people will be like leaping to their feet, being like, yeah, I can't wait, I'm not there yet. And I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what the tactics and the strategy, the tactics and strategies are. I think it's possible. I, I think it's possible. Uh, okay. uh, Please? Um, <laughs> I think it's possible, but for us, we've spoken to a lot of our, our friends, family, um, and others about, about finances and about where they're headed and, and you know, the path they're on um, in, the, in their job world and you know, the corporate environment. We speak to them about inflation and uh, different different, I guess, different aspects of, of business. And so we would tell them everything, all the information, like you said, we give them a whole bunch of information. So it's like, oh, yeah, 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 it's okay. You know, I'll, I'll be fine. We, we see that there will be some people that will just not follow the program, no matter how great that program is. They won't so follow it. Expand on that. Okay, yeah, so no, no matter how great that program is, so for, for us, it's like, okay, if that's the case, we need to address it with uh, a larger group. We have to continue to spread that message. Why? Because those people aren't going to get it. And if we continue to try to be on the pavement and, and speaking to them, we're just going to tire ourselves out and not be able to reach the people that actually need it. As far as solutions, that's one solution, just bigger group. You know, this is one small setting. This is the beginning of it. And this is how you start to get momentum. And then eventually you'll see people that will get on board. As far as solutions, I was thinking, Gamification. I don't know as far like especially the younger generation, whether it's, it's Snapchat or whether it's other games like uh, what's the game's on the phone. I don't even play games on the phone. <laughs> but you know like <laughs> Yeah, well well like Angry Birds? Oh, Angry um, Birds and yeah, all, all Oh the all, samurai yeah. fruit thing? All that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. If if there's goals added to goals added to the uh, the ultimate goal of uh, decrease of pollution. So there can be different slices of how to get there, different games of how to get there. But if you start to gamify and bring in the tech community, and now you have, you still have your youth that are now following that program, but you also have older individuals that are playing games at 70, 80 years old. So you can still bring everyone in. I think in education at some point that everyone's going to have like the VR headset on and be like, I'm saving the environment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just a weird juxtaposition to think about technology and what it creates. I mean, in terms of, I've worked a lot in smart eyewear as a mm -hmm. consultant, helping electronics companies build smart eyewear products. Mm -hmm. And the amount of resources that go into even building PCB chips 
and all these flex circuits and all the electronics. It is a massive amount of waste. And then I think about that just in terms of the technological footprint and what it does to the environment. But I think you make you raise a really good point about gamification. It's how one would process meaningful behavioral change. And I think games are actually a very good idea. I'm sorry. When you said that, I, I had the same problem. It's like you're leaving someone and you know, they know, we all know that's the solution they want. Right. And then they just don't take action because they have those core beliefs that there are those stigmas that they don't want to break because it's their comfort zone. It's their, they don't have the replacement. You're right. It's, 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 for me, it's been an ongoing struggle. For I don't have, like, sometimes I question my existence because I just get to get in my head. <laughs> On a one-on-one -on -one scale, that works. On one-to-many, I don't really know how to make that happen. If you're in Nelson Mandela and you have apartheid, I think most people are like, we don't want apartheid. At least that part of his job was easy. We want fairness and justice and equality. Here, it's a little more difficult. The gamifying, I like that. Now, I'm not a tech person. Like From my perspective, what I want to do is excite people who want to do that, who like that. The tech community is so much. Like When I go on like Reddit or Hacker News, they're like, Entrepreneurship can do anything. We can get to Mars. We can do all these different things. And you're like, well, what about leveling off the population? Like, no, we must have growth forever. And they're like, we can do anything, but not that. And they're like, technology is like, it can do anything, but it can't stop global warming. How come there's such hard limits that they put on, on things? So I, I'm just kind of right now exploring like what the, what the beliefs and, and ethos are. But I'd love to get someone who's like, I'm going to do that. I'm going to go to the tech community and communicate with the tech community in a certain way that works with them. But I think it's going to have to, you know, what he talked about is have people feel like, this is what I want. That to me is like, that's lacking now and we need. Or the solution requires. Just working on the institutions, just working on government, just working on laws, just spreading information, not doing it. The price of gas drops a penny and it's like everyone's buying a new SUV. It's, no one's doing, everyone's, the opposite would be sacrifice for them. And to talk about population, keeping the population from going up forever, People are all like, oh, it's going down in some places, but that's not, that's luck. There's no guarantee it's going to stay that way, and it's going up in other places. And we don't even know where the, we don't know what the carrying capacity is. Has anyone thought about what the, what the carrying capacity, people try to get the number, maybe we're above it, maybe we're below it. Better technology can raise it because if you have more solar, you can, you know, increase the carrying, okay. What does the earth look like at the carrying capacity, at the most number of people? Well, here's one picture. Imagine everyone's living happily and there's tons of resources for everybody. That's not the caring capacity because there's abundance. So you got to put more people in. You got to keep putting more people in until there's no more, until the next person you put in, someone else has to die. That's the caring capacity. You know, you can argue a little bit here and there, but I put to you, we don't want to be anywhere near the caring capacity. As we approach a caring capacity, I mean, maybe we're above it. The numbers I look at, it looks like we're above it. But as we get closer to it, we have to devote more and more resources to humans and away from other things. That means extinction. When we are at the carrying capacity, there are no elephants on the planet. There are no whales. There's rats and, and pigeons and cockroaches because we can't get rid of them. But that's what we got. We got a planet with like not much to go on. Probably we want to be well below the carrying capacity. Because then you have a lot, to, you know, if, you know, then you can fly because, you know, you put a little more carbon dioxide in the environment, a few more trees grow somewhere else. It works out. People who know operations know if you operate a factory at perfect efficiency, any little problem, the whole factory's down. Whereas if you're nowhere near that, you can have some problems and you know you use up the reserves until you can fix the thing that broke. I think we'd be more comfortable. We'd be more happy to be there. But to get there is like to talk about population. People are like, oh, it's like eugenics and all this other stuff that comes up. And it's like you didn't. That's not necessary because, for better or for worse, we die on our own. If you have your kids, then the population naturally will go down. But people are like, we must grow for economic reasons. There's a whole other school of like not of, of like stable economies. I want to wrap up at least my part to say that do we all have role models, people we'd like to emulate, people we'd like to be more like? If anyone here is you're perfect, come to me afterward and tell me because <laughs> I'm not there. I don't know about your role models. My role, I've, I've said the names of role models of mine, like Mandela and King and people like that. You know yours. Think of them. Did they get there by eating cookies and ice cream? Was it the easy road for them? It's usually a challenge. And I've heard people say, and I've felt this, poor me, I don't live in apartheid. I don't live in some, you know, World War II, so I can't 
overcome the challenges that they did, so I can't rise to the level that they did, because my life is just too comfortable. Poor me. You've heard this sentiment, right? Overcoming challenges, it doesn't just build up skills. It reveals things inside you. We happen to live at a time where we have a challenge. This, if you want to become like your role models, if you want to face challenges and live up to what your potential is, to discover what that potential is, and reach it, forget about saving the planet, forget about anything else, just for your own, you have your role models, you have people that you want to be like. You have it right here, right now. Is not eating packaged food going to bring me up to being the next Thoreau? I don't know. But it's bringing me toward that. And it's there for you. It's there for everybody. I think that is something that you have that, for me, it's food, it's travel, or, la you know, what was looking like deprivation, but is now the joy of it. And it's enriching my life, and it's making me, it's, I'm approaching, like, Thoreau is one of my big ones. It's there for all of you, too. This is where I want to get to, is people say, this is a big challenge. This is a global challenge. This is a billion people changing their behavior, and I might be at the forefront of making that happen in a couple decades for my kids, for culture, for society, but ultimately for myself, for me to become who I want to be. I hope that I make that connection. This is the start. You guys are outside of one-on-one -on -one conversations and, and things with like my students in a small, in a few small groups. You, you're the first people that I don't know who you are <laughs> that I'm doing this. Looks like I haven't hit a mine yet on this one, although I'm not sure if you guys are, I don't know what's going to happen. This is my gift to you. I don't know. If I was on your, this is the opportunity to be on the forefront of something that I don't see in the world, of leading people to change their behavior for reasons that they want to, to be glad to, that they will look back and say thank you for influencing for less pollution and having a more clean planet. I want to take questions, but thank you guys for coming here. Thank you guys. I think it's best because it's such a small group. If we can keep it just more conversational, thank you for a lot packed in there. Yeah. We didn't have to touch on half the stuff. Well, we didn't have a chance to even talk about the book at all, which I think is there are a lot of ways to actually create these things and actions within your own life that are kind of rooted right in the leadership step by step. It's an exceptional book, so I highly recommend it. But just in terms of opening up the conversation, what are some of the things that are on your mind in terms of leadership in the environment? I know we discussed a few things during the talk, but you guys have any other things that are kind of percolating upstairs at the moment, or you guys want to discuss, or... I, mean, I have a comment. I mean, though it may seem like you have a recent mind, see the seed has been planted. When we do go to the grocery store, or you do have food that's packaged, uh, there will be something that says, that, that says, hey, do I really need this? Or do I really need to buy this? Can I get something else that's not packaged? And the mindset's there. We, 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 we were vegan for a month and a half. Uh, <laughs> last year, <laughs> uh, we talked about revisiting. So, I don't think it's uh, what you said has been lost mm -hmm. by anyone here. They may have blocked it out a little bit, but it, it's that seed is still there. So. Why did you stop being vegan? Uh, meal prep, taking the time out to actually get fresh fruits and vegetables, instant gratification, whether it's going to get fast food or cooking right on the stove, this meat. But yeah, it was it was really just the meal prep and the time it takes and and not having the experience with it uh, prior to like my family was never be no one in my family was even they wouldn't even think about it. But not having those flavors that you have or recipes and I think that was we had a couple of recipes that came out okay, I thought, but more of a variety. Yeah, I don't have any recipes. It's all been like trial and error. It really was like a long period of, oh, I, I did the CSA, uh, where I get a farm, I, I go to pickup point and I pick up every week a bunch of vegetables. So I, that's where these things, like I didn't know what a tomatillo was. Now I think they're really delicious. And I was like, I don't know what they are. And so my default was steam them, because my rule was no vegetable gets thrown away. Nothing gets thrown away. It was really a long period of just like, I don't know what these things are, I'm just going to eat them. And before I could like figure out how to put them together. And that period, you know, on the... But that right there can help, like your takeaway from that can help somebody else who may not have the willpower to keep trying something new. Your, what you found through that long process, being put together somehow um, as a guide, and I know there's millions of different guides on how to prepare certain things, but we're in a group like this, that's, a, that's something that can help me say, okay, well, 
I mean, it may not take me several months to figure out how to cook these random vegetables I can use, but he's helped me learn, and now the pain point is gone. There's a video I put online of me. I like to set up a camera of me, like, email me. Let me put my email up here. I put it online and I posted it, and people are like, this is a boring video. I'm like, it wasn't supposed to be funny. <laughs> it was just supposed to show that I, this is how I make, it's like 20 minutes to make a full pot of, do you have a pressure cooker? Get a pressure cooker. I highly recommend a pressure cooker. And uh, it's just fun, you know, and like, I bring people over. But here, if, I'll, I'll send you the link to it. Once ago, Josh told me about eating more vegetables, and I was like, that's great. And he's explaining this, yeah, it's great. I get this, I did, and I'm in my head, I'm like, I've been in the fitness trainer for 14 years. I'm like, yeah, great. That's awesome. <laughs> That's really awesome. I did the whole, like, vegan, vegan, raw food, vegan, all kinds of diet, I need for my job. So it didn't click, click until like, we sat at his place, and he, like, it was like the third time I was over, and he made me a bowl. And, like, he, he took all the vegetables out, and he just cut them up, tossed them in. 15 minutes later, I was like, That's it? And you're like, Yeah. He's like, Wait, so how much food is that? He's like, Two days. I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> that was, we talked about like a big topic for 10 I didn't even realize how much time. I was like five minutes past. And that was it. And I do meal prep too. I do like the sweet potatoes and the grass fed beef and all this. Yeah. And it's like it would take about an hour, hour and a half for like a day and a half, two days. Yeah. With that, I was like, all right, so I'm going to go on Amazon. What's the name of the name brand? Okay, it's 50 bucks. Cool. 50 bucks. For the pressure cooker. For the pressure cooker. It lasts a lot longer than. For me, there's this big sense of ownership because I discovered the stuff. You know, when you figure it out yourself, you're like, because if someone told me, get a pressure cooker and follow these recipes, I'd be like, I wouldn't do it. So now if you had a spread of food here, just to make a suggestion. Lee and I, I talked about that. If, about I, if I would know that, and this is just about the food portion, but if I knew that all these meals are actually easy to cook and taste amazing, and, you, and they, you've given me all the tools that I need and I'm experiencing myself, that's one less thing for me to have to try to figure out. You know, I, I taught this semester, I taught this class in systems thinking, and they were like, how does this connect to your life? And I was like, talking about food. And I blurted out to my class, I was like, it's delicious. I, I wish I could tell you. I mean, I, I can tell you, but you can't taste it. And I just blurted out, I'll cook you all dinner. <laughs> and one thing led to another, we had our last class at my place. It was adult, so, and, uh, and, uh, my doorman said that he was like, yeah, when they're on their way out, they're all saying it was really good. But do you see this community aspect? Like, I didn't used to bring people over for dinner so much, but now I really like it. This fun is what I want, like this, to me, this is really fun. I'm still like struggling. I'm not where it's, I don't know if it's, if it's going to get to where I think humanity has to go and the time to do it. But it's not like I'm not flying, like I'm not, I'm, I'm missing out on Whatever. By the way, you know, I'm, I'm scheduled to fly to, uh, in October, speaking at some conference in, in Europe. So it's not like I'm never going to fly again. But I think, like you said, with, um, just small steps. Oh, I don't know what you said. I think you said it. With just small, uh, taking small steps. So the small step is the food. But everyone can have their own slice of how do I make the planet better. So this region, we can say it's food. Somewhere else is saying we don't fly. Someone else is saying, um, uh, we only throw out trash, you know, once a week or something like that. So, but if you have a community, uh, once every six months. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well not everyone. We're gonna work. Gonna it work. takes a while to get there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so everyone can have their own spice, and and if you look at it too, because I, I went to Peru. No, I went to Peru. Akiba. Right. So I went. I went to Peru um, after I got back from Afghanistan in 2013. And I did, it was an ayahuasca retreat. So down there, they everything's grown fresh, mm -hmm. um, and they use the compost from you know what's excreted, you know, um, when, I'm, when we defecate, and, you know, they take that and use compost mm -hmm. for for um, vegetables and everything like that. So you have a community. If, I mean, if you're looking at the U.S., you're like, oh, it's a whole bunch of waste. But if you look outside of the U.S., there are communities in South America and other places where everything is. You know, it's fresh, and they treat the environment with respect. Um, and so, if we can also bring them on board, they do have technology, some don't, but they do, and that can be also they can also add to the community. Environment. That we can learn from them. Right, and we can learn from them. Yeah, Correct. yeah. I'm not saying I'm not saying we should return to the Stone Age by any stretch of the imagination. I like the internet. We got solar power. We might have fusion one day, but we've definitely lost touch. There's something that I feel like we've lost touch with, like nature. 
I mean, if you look at what humanity has done, like, I think of, when I think of, like, what we've done, like, we've created culture and, and societies and all these amazing things, but also if I look at, like, Manhattan, all it, it used to be covered with trees, and now it's, like, a lot of rock and stuff. And if I think of the Met and MoMA and Lincoln Center, I think it's amazing. But I can't deny that it's, like, it looks like a mess, and if I look at the sky, it's all, you know, when I mean, you fly in, it's, like, dingy, and you're like, oh, I'm making it dingy. I think we can change that without, I think we can reduce that a lot. Yeah. Thank you for being here. So I, I run an environmental, um, I don't know if I can call it a leadership program, but I do a program for a lot of students, but also teachers that are training in the city, based on citizen science. And so what my goal is when I when I think that I make the most impact is when I get people to think revolutionary. Because I think that's, that's the point that people miss. What is this action going to do for not my generation, for the next generation and the next generation after? Because people have a lot of problems with various solutions. We are fast paced, if we do something, I don't care if I get stuck in 10 minutes, but what's happening to you all around me? So I think getting people to think about this, like, and then you have to acknowledge evolution, which means a problem I'm very often when I talk to people. They depend on how evolution is not real, and you know, and then we have this discussion, which is fine too, right? But just see that there's change going on over time, which is outside of your personal scope, is very important. Mm -hmm. And the next thing that I say, and most storytelling, you can start because that's what have you. How many people here have observed someone changing their behavior specifically to reduce their pollution, their global warming footprint? Significantly, like a major change to life. What was it? Can you, what was your example? Me, besides me. Besides you? Yeah. Besides you, my old roommate. How big was the change? She was, she went to change from being a meat eater to now being fully vegan. Uh, she also changed how she shopped. She no longer went and bought department store things. She went to buying secondhand and also making her own clothes. So those are her two largest transformations that I watched happen over the last three years. How many other people have seen? Can I, can I yeah. I, I've seen yeah. Well, let me just say, I have seen almost no one change. Almost no one change. This is a try and fail. Well, yeah, that, that I qualify as not changing. I've seen almost no change. And people just, their responses for why they shouldn't change are so self-serving and so entitled. Here's something that like, I get pushed back on a lot, and I'm going to say it to you guys, knowing that I might get pushed back, but before the year of not flying, I thought, I don't know if I could do it. Over the course of doing it, and this is something I can't, it's experiential, is that people are so entitled to fly. They're just like, my mom went to Rome and said the tomatoes were amazing. How can I not go to Rome? Like, she went to Rome, I get to go to Rome. Something that was not conceived of as physically possible a little over a century ago. People now say it's absolutely impossible for them to live without it. I'm like, NYU, people throw around entitled and privileged, you know, this term all over the place, which often like silences people. And they don't see in themselves how much flying, it's just one thing, but it's one thing that you have absolute control over. You can choose not to get in an airplane. I'm not telling people what to do, but the entitlement that people have is to me, why do you see the, the intensity of the emotion here? Because it's me, right? It was me for a long time too. And I'm looking at myself, and I'm kind of angry at myself. The arguments that people have why they should not change are so, what's the word, specious and self-serving. Again, I'm talking about myself for many things, a few things less now than before. We're talking about things that could work, but I hope that people change themselves. Yeah. When we talk about a global community, and we talk about um, internet connected, which fuels a lot of the progress and innovation that we have that allows us to have computers and many of the things we take for granted. When you tell someone that flying on a plane in fact impacts the world negatively, but at the same time you don't offer them an alternative to being able to possibly not just visit somewhere else, but interact and get new experiences from interacting with someone else on the other side of the planet or even three you know, states away. That you have, I think one has to bring that 
into the conversation to get a valid response to for the empathy that has to come with not telling someone that you're taking something or suggesting you're removing something from their life, but you can't prove to them or or share with them your experience in totality because they need that community, that social community that the airplane provides. Like I know they're not I know they're trying to build better airplanes, but it's not going to be twenty or thirty years before we have that unless Elon Musk comes up with a really smart idea that people and, and the thing is he's a leader, that's why I use his name because people want his ideas to be something that benefits them, even though you know any number of companies can come up with a solution. But the problem is when you say, okay, I didn't take a, a plane, they go, fine, but my grandmother lives in California, and if I don't listen to my grandmother, if she dies, I'm going to feel guilty. Those are, those are real life things that people are confronted with. I think part of our job, because I feel everyone here who came here is a leader in their own respect, is to find those answers to, okay, if you're not going to take the plane, what are some other things that you can do to bridge those gaps so you don't feel that necessarily your choice is a loss, but a search for a new solution? Yeah, that's the sentiment that people don't have. They just get to this point of, but I have to fly, therefore no. That is not how your role models got to be your role models. They did things that no one did before. They figured it out themselves. Part of me, like I try to give an example. Here's what happened with me. It can happen with you. To some extent, I'm asking you to have faith, belief without evidence, in yourselves, in your ability to make your life as rich as it ever was. I'm saying that we're living on a planet of limited resources, physical material stuff. There's so much stuff here. I'm not saying that there's a limitation to the amount of happiness and joy and community and fun and all those things. There's no limitation on that. Yes, if your grandmother lives somewhere, you may feel guilty about that. And you will resolve that. I think you will find ways to make your life better than it would have been otherwise. The future, people are going to live differently than they live today. I guarantee that. Nature may cause that to happen, and we're not going to like that. Because that's disease, pestilence, war, famine. If we figure it out ourselves, it's, I don't know. But I think it's a lot more vegetables. No shortage of delicious. A lot more of knowing your neighbor. There's still the internet. We're still going to be able to fly around, just not as much. When I was in college, I drank a lot of beer. It was really fun. Now I have scotch every now and then. I appreciate it a lot more. I think that's where we're going to be. It's like greater appreciation, less waste, more joy, more delicious, convenient, save money, community, things like that. If you guys are going to contact me, then let me know if, if that happens. It may take six months. I don't know. It took me a long time before the food started really getting good. Before I was like not thinking so much of what I was missing elsewhere, but how much I was getting by staying here. Now it's really close to eight. One rule I have is I, I never want people to be late to the next thing because of me. Thank you guys. Keep in touch. <laughs> Maybe sometime this will be like, they'll be like, oh, I knew that was, I was at the first one. Guys, this meetup is also a work in progress, too. Do you guys have any notes on how to make it more conversational for future events or want to contribute ideas? Um, feel free to reach out in the forum. Thank you so much. We're always open to improving and refining and that kind of thing. Thank you guys very much for coming out. We yeah. appreciate it. Thank you for having And if people want to take an active role, let me know, because in the long run, I don't know, there'll be whole teams of people and stuff like that, but in the short run, whatever people are good at. The gamifying stuff, I really want to make a pitch. At some point I want to do something like this, and at the end say, if you want to commit to doing something, go to this web page and make a public statement that you're going to commit to a week of no meat or delaying one trip a little bit longer or something like that. And then it'll give you, it'll give you an email, and it'll partner you up with someone. But I don't know how to, I, I don't know how to make that web page.